talk a little bit about tech diversity. Uh, the tech world is an interesting one. In so many ways, it prides itself on being innovative and disruptive, the industry that defines the future. And yet, in so many ways, it is also incredibly backwards. And very noticeably, uh, notably, this is the case with diversity and inclusion. Tech diversity is having a real moment right now, uh, especially in the last few months after Susan Fowler came forward with her blog post about her time at Uber. And even more recently, multiple female founders have come forward, been on record about being sexually harassed by Justin Kalbeck, a VC at the firm Binary Capital, who was then forced to step down the firm to shut down. And about other big names, like Dave McClure at 500 Startups, who has also been forced to resign. It is clearly not a healthy ecosystem in which these things are happening. We've hit a bit of a tipping point such that some of these very egregious stories are starting to come out, but they're symptomatic of much more pervasive problems. And though it's particularly trendy at the moment to push pledges and quick hit solutions, I think it's important that we understand the issues more systemically and rigorously so that we can design solutions that are effective and long lasting. For me, the starting point for that is with the data. A few years ago, I wrote a Medium post titled, Where Are the Numbers? I had been struck by the hypocrisy of an industry in which the problem of the lack of diversity was an open secret, and yet no companies were willing to measure and manage it. An industry in which everything is supposed to be data-driven, and yet there was no data on diversity. And without data, there was no language for describing the magnitude and pervasiveness of the problem and it was too easy to dismiss. Somewhat surprisingly, the response to my Medium post was that people actually did start sharing their numbers. First, it was data on women in engineering, and then came more holistic data, holistic data reports describing both gender and race slash ethnicity numbers for tech and leadership as well. Before I get too much further, I do want to acknowledge that most of my talk focuses on gender diversity, which is not to conflate gender diversity with all diversity or to diminish the importance of addressing diversity comprehensively and examining intersectionality with race, class, ability, and other dimensions of identity and marginalization, but is mainly because there is much more research around gender. And so with that disclaimer, um, let's take a look at some of these numbers. Here's a snapshot of some data from 2015. As you can see, the percentage of women in tech roles at tech companies is somewhere around 20%. And mind you, this is a generous interpretation of tech that includes not just engineering, but also product management and design and other functions supporting product development. Some bright news is that across the board, these numbers have been inching upwards. So these are the numbers for 2016. Uh, still low, but trending the right way with some very concerted effort. So I can show you 2015, 2016. Let's also take a look at women in leadership numbers. Female leadership numbers look slightly better because they include both tech and non-tech. And it is similarly encouraging to see some slight improvement in these numbers as we move from 2015 to 2016. One unfortunate low light is that the venture capital industry is in far worse straits. Uh, the latest data I could find was a TechCrunch tech study from 2016 showing that only 7% of senior investment leadership is female. A 2015 report from the information showed women at less than 6% of investment decision makers at major US venture capital firms. Um, and that was defined by firms that have raised at least 100 million in capital since 2009. VC money is often what determines who even gets a chance to try to build their ideas into companies. The lack of diversity amongst VCs means missing out on a lot of great ideas just because they might not make sense to the swaths of mostly privileged white male VCs, or because they're being pitched by people who don't pattern match well against past founders. And more dangerously, we've also seen bad behavior amongst male VCs who take advantage of their money as power to harass or manipulate female founders. An important part of solving this lack of representation in tech and VC is understanding the roots of the problem and how we got here. Mysteriously enough, there were actually more women in tech and in VC in the past. Over the last few decades, we've seen the trend go the wrong way. Germane to this question at hand 
In 2014, NPR did a Planet Money podcast titled When Women Stopped Coding. It's hard to say definitively what happened, but here's what NPR found. The share of women in computer science started falling at roughly the same time when personal computers started showing up in US homes in significant numbers. The inflection point on the graph is 1984. Back then, computers were expensive. Most households wouldn't have more than one, and they were nothing as cool and multi-purpose as they are today. There wasn't much you could do on computers besides some basic word processing and, more importantly, games. Games which were and still often are thought to be the domain of boys. Computers, too, then, were thought to be the domain of boys. In some households, the computers would physically be placed in the boys' bedrooms, off limits to their sisters, and in other cases, the boundaries were sociological, as girls were discouraged from associating too closely with toys and activities for the boys. NPR points to research that Jane Margolis did at Carnegie Mellon in the 90s, which she wrote up in her book, Unlocking the Clubhouse, that suggests that early exposure to computers gave boys a leg up once they arrived at university and were primed to study computer science. That doesn't tell the whole story, though. If the only explaining factor for the reversal in trend were that personal computers started showing up in homes in the early 80s, then the timing doesn't quite line up. There should have been a lag of a few years before those kids playing with those computers grew up and went to college. And so maybe it's instructive to dig into the data a little further. The first graph we saw plotted out the percentage of women in computer science. By contrast, here's a graph that has the raw numbers on enrollment, stacked by gender. A few things to note, overall enrollment has gone up and down and up and down dramatically a couple of times in the last few decades. Even though the percentage of women in CS has been decreasing steadily, the actual number has gone up and down. And so relevant to that mystery we're trying to unravel, that inflection point where the percentage of women starts to drop is after a period of dramatic increase in overall enrollment. Students could see this excitement and growth in the tech sector and wanted to be a part of it. The problem was that CS departments struggled to handle the increase in class sizes, and they faced an academic hiring crisis. Instructors took on additional workloads. Departments tried to retrain faculty from adjacent departments. They brought on adjunct, adjunct professors from industry but it wasn't enough to increase the staffing supply. The other strategy was to reduce the demand by limiting enrollment. In some cases, they did so by imposing stricter requirements. In other cases, it was a more implicit self-selection process, as difficult introductory classes, sometimes called weeder classes, dissuaded students from continuing in the major. These filters, though, disproportionately affected certain sectors of the population. For example, women who are well-documented in underrating their own abilities and students who didn't have as much prior exposure to computers and computing. Women also often fell into this category. Computer science became a much more exclusive club, but on dimensions not actually correlated with performance in the major. Alongside the definition of that exclusive club, cue the emergence of a certain geek mythology, the image of the geek boy genius with a singular fixation on computers and everything nerdy. And as that became more and more the image of who codes, who does computer science, who is a software engineer, girls have felt less and less welcome in the field. Even in the Social Network movie, which came out in 2010, that's how Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, and his friends were portrayed, nerdy hacker geniuses bedecked in hoodies. Ironically enough, one shift in recent years towards greater inclusivity has been, wait for it, the rise of the programmer. So now you can be either a nerdy guy or a bro-y guy, and either way you fit in. <laughs> Partly because of these image issues, one argument that tech companies like to make is that their diversity issues stem from a pipeline problem, that there aren't enough women choosing to study computer science because they're just not interested in it, and therefore there aren't enough women graduating from computer science programs, and it's an issue upstream that is unfortunate but isn't our responsibility to fix. I won't say that there isn't a pipeline problem, and the pipeline problem does have to be addressed. Organizations like code.org, which is working to bring CS education to K through 12 across the United States, are doing that. But that's not enough, because it's definitely not just a pipeline problem. Women that have indicated 
express interest and ability in tech and have entered the field are leaving it way too quickly. Women leave tech at more than twice the rate that men do. 41% of women leave tech within 10 years versus 17% of men. And plus, if there are so many women entering the field, entering tech in the 80s, it's a bit disingenuous to say that the lack of women in tech leadership is a result of pipeline problems. What's interesting is that women in tech aren't leaving the workplace at any higher rates than women in other industries. That is, they're switching to other jobs. And they're no more likely to cite family or work-life reasons as a factor for leaving. The issue is specifically tech. And the biggest reason that explains women's exit from tech is dissatisfaction with pay and promotion opportunities. Cut from another angle, it's a lack of mentorship and sponsorship and a, career, a roadmap for career progression. To say nothing of the culture, there's no shortage of stories of the unfriendly, unsupportive, or even hostile environment that women in tech and VC have had to deal with. For example, as I mentioned at the top of my talk, Susan Fowler recently came forward with a blog post detailing her experiences as an engineer at Uber. A couple years ago, Ellen Powell made headlines when she sued her employer, the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins, for sexual harassment and gender discrimination, laying bare in court the dirty inner workings of one of Silicon Valley's once most revered firms. To be fair, some workplace culture issues aren't unique to tech. Women face barriers to advancement across essentially every industry, as seen by the low levels of representation of women in leadership across all of business and government, particularly in the US. Women have to walk a fine line between being too aggressive and too subservient. Women are presented with the likability competence paradox, where perceptions of their likability and competence are inversely correlated. Women are asked to take on the office housework, like note-taking and other menial tasks, and are expected to help out others, even at the cost of doing their own work well. Some people wonder if this matters, or if it matters enough for us to invest any effort in diversity. My response is that it is kind of just the right thing to do, to build an industry that's diverse and inclusive of people from all backgrounds. But it's also the smart thing to do. The World Economic Forum frames it as three distinct arguments. First, the diversity case, second, the consumer case, and third, the talent case. In the context of innovation work, research demonstrates that diverse teams are more creative, more diligent and thoughtful, and most importantly for the business case, drive better financial returns. And it's not just correlation. Controlled experiments show that having diversity on teams causes them to be stronger. It's impossible to do causal analysis on, industry, on firms and industry, but the data there is still very compelling. A report released last year in 2016, studying nearly 22,000 publicly traded companies across 91 countries, showed that an increase in the share of women in top management from 0 to 30% was associated with a 15% rise in profitability. From the McKinsey report, Diversity Matters, that came out in 2015, there is an even stronger finding in support of racial diversity. Companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry means. There's a pretty clear business case for diversity here. Second is the consumer case. For the tech industry, we're building products for everyone. The quality, relevance, and impact of these products and services can only be improved by having the people who are building them be demographically representative of the people who are using them. Here's a glaring example of an oversight that probably would have been prevented by having some more gender diversity on the team. Apple launched HealthKit in iOS 8 as a comprehensive act to track nearly everything you can think of tracking, blood alcohol, content, inhaler usage, sodium intake, except somehow they missed period tracking. Perhaps one of the most obvious use cases of quantified self and one that affects nearly half the global population and somehow overlooked. The last major argument for diversity as a strategic and competitive advantage is in talent and hiring. The Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that by 2020 there will be a shortfall of one million workers to fill open computer science jobs. The tech industry severely underutilizes the talent that exists in our economy with its systemic exclusion of certain sectors of the population. It seems obvious that we should, say, tap into those parts of the population. 
Talent is equally distributed. Opportunity is not. The first diversity data reports started coming out in 2014. As we've seen, there has been some improvement, but it's been so slow as to be imperceptible in most cases. The first step was getting the data out there, but the data itself hasn't been enough to drive meaningful change. Last year, I and seven other women in tech got together to brainstorm and see what we could really do to push the tech industry towards solutions. We wanted to give tech companies and leaders a framework for thinking about diversity and inclusion and to write down recommendations and resources so they could turn their motivation around doing the right thing into effective action. This effort became Project Include, and we've challenged the tech industry to approach diversity and inclusion with a strategy guided by inclusivity, comprehensiveness, and accountability. Inclusivity because diversity means much more than just gender diversity. To truly build diverse organizations, we have to understand the intersections of gender with race, class, age, ability, and so many other dimensions of identity and experience. Comprehensiveness, because one-off tactics like anonymizing resumes, attending conferences, signing pledges, they feel good, but they don't constitute real change. Accountability, because you can't manage what you don't measure. And without metrics, there's no way of understanding whether we're making progress or not. As Project Include, we've also provided recommendations and resources for tech startups to take on. We hope that these help to guide concrete action. A metaphor that one of my Project Include teammates likes to use is that of debt. Sometimes you need to take on debt just to, keep go just to get going, and it's a trade-off in favor of the short term versus the long term. It's okay to make that trade-off deliberately. But the longer you wait to pay off your debt, the harder it gets to do so because the debt compounds. This is true of financial debt, technical debt, and very much so of diversity debt. It's much harder to change an organization of thousands or tens of thousands or even more than it is to set the right cultural norms and organizational processes in a team of five or 10. And this is why we are so focused on startups and getting things right from the beginning. I often get people asking me what they can do as individuals. Uh, that's a very hard question to answer, and I think it's analogous to people asking what they can do as individuals to affect culture, their companies, or to drive growth or revenue. And actually, diversity and inclusion efforts are a blend of both these cultural and business considerations. There are lots of little things, but the things that will be meaningful for individuals will vary by who those individuals are. And it's different for women versus male allies, underrepresented minorities versus members of the dominant racial and ethnic groups, individual contributors versus managers and executives, and obviously all these dimensions intersect, which makes the conversation even trickier. The first thing I would recommend is to read up on these issues and understand the basics. Some of them are things I've just covered in this talk. Diversity is important. It's smart for business, not just a feel-good endeavor. But how we achieve diversity means confronting the deep and uncomfortable reasons for why we don't have it now. It's not just a pipeline problem, although, of course, there is a pipeline problem as well. There are structural impediments for women and minorities in industry. To correct course, which means changing culture and process, will require a lot of hard work. One more thing I haven't covered yet uh, that I do think belongs in a Diversity 101 talk and deserves a special call out because it comes up so much is the misconception that diversity means lowering the bar. Um, it doesn't. First of all, there is no bar. Uh, we're not doing the high jump here. There's not a single dimension that we're evaluating on some vertical distance off the ground that someone is trying to clear. When we consider candidates and teammates, they're multidimensional human beings that are strong in some characteristics, weaker in others, and are also described by experiential, cognitive, personal, interpersonal characteristics that aren't strong or weak, but just are. Semantics out of the way, the idea that hiring more women or minorities inherently means lowering the bar is sexist and racist. When someone says, I'd hire more women if there were qualified women, that if poses a question of whether or not qualified women exist and suggests that they don't. When hiring managers complain that they can't find qualified female candidates, it often means that they're looking in the wrong places or looking for the wrong things. For example, the obsession with hiring software engineers out of Stanford and MIT means that these schools are very overfished small ponds and it's hyper competitive to sign them on, even when there are amazing pools of talent elsewhere. And whether or not someone has a brand name CS degree 
has very little bearing on their ability to do the job. With that understanding of the basics, it is incumbent on all of us to stay alert to the ways in which processes, cultural norms, or individual actions create bias against certain demographics and try to counter those. Sometimes that means reminding decision makers to consider non-traditional candidates for leadership or growth opportunities, people that aren't the usual suspects. Sometimes that means taking notes of who gets a chance to talk during meetings or who's heard and making sure that's equitable. Sometimes that means reminding people to be inclusive as they're planning social activities. Sometimes that means calling people out on bad behavior or language. Maybe some of you have heard of the phrase death by a thousand paper cuts, which describes the experience of suffering through all the little slights, being patronized, being overlooked, being underestimated, being left out, none of which are so bad in of themselves, individually, but repeated over and over drive people out. Know that countering those thousand paper cuts means lots and lots of little interventions. So, this is my last slide. I included this image somewhat ironically because this t-shirt pains me every time I see Jack wearing it. But the point I want to make and the last piece of advice I want to give is for everyone to embrace the fact that we're all still learning and figuring this out, even if we're individually at different points in our journey. And this is true for those who haven't taken part in the conversation yet, and it's also very true for those who are already engaged in the conversation. It's a constant process of seeking out those stories and experiences of people different from us and listening carefully to them and learning how to be helpful. <laughs>